Hello, I'm Dr. Benjamin Norris, and I'm from Frostburg State University. And in this video, uh, we're going to talk about the stereochemistry of electrocyclic reactions. In a previous video, I introduced the idea of an electrocyclic reaction, a reaction of a conjugated polyene uh, undergoing some kind of ring closure, though, though the ring opening versions are also uh, things that can happen. And I described that this reaction is uh, stereo-specific, uh, or diastereo-specific. So knowing the stereochemistry of the reactant tells me the stereochemical outcome in the product. And I want to make it clear that the reactions that we're going to talk about here first are thermal reactions. They take advantage of kinetic energy that comes from the heat uh, present in the system. And so some of these reactions are actually spontaneous at room temperature, so they don't need any additional heat. Some of them require heat, but thermal here just means that we're using uh, the ambient kinetic energy, whether, whether we're supplying that or not, uh, to get the reaction to go. And this reaction is diastereospecific, so the change in the stereochemistry of the reactants changes the stereochemistry in the product in a diastereomerically uh, specific way. And because the reactant is not chiral, any time that we produce an, an, uh, a chiral molecule, we're going to produce the racemic mixture. And so now I am ready to propose an explanation that helps uh, this diastereo specificity make sense. And to do so, we need to look at uh, a molecular orbital understanding of what is going on here. And so here I've got the molecular orbital. Uh, or a molecular orbital of 135 hexatriene. And to be specific, this is the homo of 135 hexatriene. This is the highest occupied molecular orbital. It's the highest energy orbital with electrons in it. But this particular picture of the orbital isn't, isn't helpful because the conformation of the molecule needed to undergo the cyclization doesn't look like that. It looks like this. Okay. So here is that same orbital folded around into a more cyclic or cyclization friendly shape. And from this kind of picture, we can easily see how uh, the orbitals on the end carbons might need to rotate to form new bonds with each other. You know, let's rotate. There we go. And this type... And so, as this reaction is going, these orbitals and the carbon atoms attached to them and the things attached to those carbon atoms are rotating so that this new bond here can form. And I want to go back to the way the uh, orbitals were originally. I'm drawing some arrows here. These orbitals force the structure to rotate this way. One atom is rotating clockwise and the other is rotating counterclockwise. And this particular rotation motion is called disrotary action. The atoms are rotating in opposite directions. I mean, they, they feel like they're rotating towards each other, but one's rotating clockwise and the other is rotating counterclockwise. And the outcome of this is that everything attached to these two carbon atoms Everything attached to these two carbon atoms is going to rotate also. And I'm actually going to 
remove the, the other orbitals because they're hiding the rest of my structure. Right? And so that means as the bonds go through and form, drag my thing over here. As the orbitals rotate, it also rotates the hydrogen atoms, and they're going to rotate in one way, and it rotates the methyl groups, and they're going to rotate in opposite directions. And so when the bond forms between the atoms to close the ring down, the hydrogen atoms and the methyl groups have rotated so that the two methyl groups are pointing in the same direction, and the two hydrogens are pointing in the same direction. And that leads to the cis or, or sin outcome that you saw see in the first example. If our methyl groups had been, you know, if our groups had been different, If I'd instead have had the methyl group here and the hydrogen here, so this looks like the second example. These two things are rotating disrotatory, so the methyl group on one carbon is rotating up, the hydrogen is rotating down. The hydrogen on the other carbon is rotating up, and the methyl group is rotating down, and we get the other stereoisomer out of this. With my methyl group up move my hydrogen up a little bit. Get the other stereoisomer out of this. Okay. So this molecular orbital picture helps explain the origin of this stereochemistry terrible difference. atoms rotate so that the orbitals can have constructive overlap to form the new sigma bond. Now, let's look at a different one. Here is the four carbon version. And under thermal conditions, the four carbon version has a different stereochemical outcome than the six carbon version. And you might be surprised at that, but as soon as we look at the molecular orbitals, we can see why. And so this situation where both methyl groups are facing outward leads to the anti version. And if we have one methyl group facing inward, well, that leads to the sin. And it's also worth pointing out, uh, and I didn't do this for the six carbon, right? but the, the variation where both methyl groups are pointing inward also leads to anti for the, the four version, and it also leads to sin for the six carbon version. For the same reason, the methyl groups have to rotate in opposite directions. Okay. So let's look at the four carbon case and see how it's different. So here is the homo of butadiene. And again, this particular conformation isn't as useful as folding it around so that it looks like it's about ready to form that cyclic structure. Here is the homo of 1,3-butadiene with its orbitals. And we can see in this example that in order for the orbitals to rotate to form the new bonds, they need to rotate differently. One or both orbitals are going to rotate in the same 
direction. They're both going to or, or rotate, this case I'm having them rotate counterclockwise to form that new bond for constructive overlap. And like I did for the, the six carbon ring, I'm going to draw in some arrows. But my arrows are going to be drawn in a little bit differently. Right. This is called conrotatory motion because both carbon atoms are rotating in the same direction, both clockwise or both counterclockwise. So rotating clockwise would generate one enantiomer and rotating counterclockwise would generate the other enantiomer if we need to be nitpicky about it. So here we have the two, the methyl groups, and the methyl group on the left hand side is going to rotate down as it rotates counterclockwise, but the other methyl group is going to rotate up. And so as this thing rotates to form the new ring, the methyl groups are going to be rotating in the same direction, one down and one up, relative to the ring. But both are rotating counterclockwise, right? And both are rotating counterclockwise relative to the relative to the system. Right? If we were to rotate both of them clockwise, we'd get the other enantiomer. So that's how this can form both enantiomers, by rotating one way or by rotating the other way. And to get this anti-arrangement. Okay? If we switched the arrangement of the atoms making things uh, make things a little bit clearer. So one of the methyl groups was on the, the inside. Okay. Now both methyl groups are pointing in the same direction relative to the, to the ring closure. They're both rotating clockwise or counterclockwise. So both methyl groups are going to end up facing in the same direction. Okay. This is actually quite predictable. So I'm going to stop here and summarize under thermal conditions, which doesn't mean always that we have to add heat, but some of these reactions require heat. Systems that have 4N electrons, so that includes the, the butadiene, as an example, but 4n electrons react or undergo these reactions in a conrotatory rotatory fashion. Systems with 4n plus 2 electrons, so 6 electrons, undergo these kind of reactions in a disrotatory Right. In my next video, we'll go into the uh, stereochemistry of these reactions under photochemical conditions. Thank you for watching.